let people in as they join. Um, my name is Allison McMillan. Uh, I'm a director of engineering at GitHub. I am super excited to be talking about tech and Torah today. Um, so many of us in tech come from different and diverse backgrounds. Um, and I think that it's always really interesting to see how that background and how um, that different education or different industries that we're coming from uh, really impacts the way that we look at tech and look at software development. I think that it allows us to share different thoughts, different ideas, different stories, different, um, different perspectives with our peers and with the industry. So today, um, I'll be chatting with the authors of Tech and Torah a bit, and then, um, and then we'll open it up to some audience questions. So feel free to uh, send me a chat message with any specific questions that you have, so I can be sure to ask them. Um, and so I want to uh, kick off today by asking Ben and Yahil to talk a little bit about Tech and Torah and why you started this project. Yahil, why did we start this project? What were we thinking? What were we thinking? Um, like most projects, we weren't thinking. But <laughs> it started when Ben and I were coworkers at our first engineering job. Uh, Long Island, and then Ben moved away, abandoned me, and he went with his family to move to Israel, to Aliyah. And at that time, both of us were pretty sure we were uh, headed elsewhere. We were uh, actively seeking jobs somewhere else. And I was feeling kind of sad, thinking that our friendship might go the way of many other friendships that just fizzle out once we're not, you know, seeing each other all day, every day. And then Ben had the idea to start a weekly newsletter. Both Ben and I were rabbis before we joined tech. Uh, so we both had that background. We both uh, studied in yeshiva and served in the rabbinate. And um, both obviously have a passion for technology as well as a passion for Torah concepts and Torah ideas and ethics. So uh, I think Ben suggested it. So I'll let him tell us what his inspiration was. Uh, sure. So uh, I was so excited when I started the uh, coding boot camp that was my entree into software development. And I met another former rabbi, or not former rabbi, because you never are former, I've been told many times, but a former professional rabbi uh, who had worked in Jewish education, who was going into the same kind of transition. And then after we had both finished uh, around the same time, we ended up in the same job. And, uh, and we both, I think, had the sense that this world of technology is not absent from a moral or ethical conversation. That the things that we do in this world, whether it's uh, technology around facial recognition or natural language understanding or the ethics around marketing and marketing technology or ad tech as it's called or all those other areas, they all are intrinsically part of uh, and tied up to conversations around ethics, the things that we should be thinking about, the ways we conduct ourselves in this in this job. And I think, you know, it. I know from my own experience in the job, in the first time you sit as in this job as in a full time role, you sit in front of that computer, you know, and you got your couple monitors, and you, all you're surrounded by. If you're in the, if you're in this job as a developer or developer adjacent, you're just surrounded by lines of code and code editors and, and linters and, and all their kinds of tooling. And it can feel sort of abstract. But if we want to think about ways in which we can reify the abstract into concrete and think about the ways in which we can take uh, what we're doing and think about the real world implications of it, I think if we do that, that's a really worthwhile endeavor. And so as we were parting company and we weren't going to share uh, we were going to share lunches together on Long Island, uh, sort of like on the Queens Long Island border, if you know what I'm talking about. It's like Long Island Jewish hospitals, like right around that area. We weren't going to share our pizza lunches together or sit across from each other in the cubicle and like schmooze about these things. I thought, let's do this at least for ourselves. And then, and then if there was others who were interested, we didn't advertise it and we didn't share it with anyone uh, actively. 
we didn't hide it either, but we didn't share it with anyone actively because we felt that this was really like a conversation we wanted to have. And then if others were interested in joining, that'd be excellent and, and wonderful. And it just became like, a, 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 how long has it been now, Yechiel? Like, how long have we been doing this? About a year and a half. We started in Hanukkah. The first edition, our first uh, newsletter was Hanukkah in 2018. So that's about a year and a half now. Um, and yeah, like Ben said, Ben spoke about the influence of of Torah and technology where we have to have these conversations about the ethics of our work and it goes the other way around the other way as well um, you know in Judaism we believe that uh, that everything that God created in the world was in order to help us serve God properly so all these amazing capabilities that we have through technology should be used to promote goodness and kindness in the world and to promote values that help people rather than drive people apart. For example, now we're having a Torah class over a Zoom conference. Um, so, uh, so the idea of creating Torah and tech was sort of to help bridge those two, these two worlds, which sometimes run in two very different uh, directions, the world of Torah and the world of technology, and try to bring them together, the synergy, so that the Torah can inform our technology and that a technology can help us promote the Torah um, in a grand unified theory of everything. And I'll just add as a personal observation that since we started this this newsletter, part of my work where I work now is to, well, before, in the, in the before times and the before coronavirus times, when I attended a lot of developer conferences, uh, word had started sort of spreading around this uh, newsletter. And I would get feedback from people how helpful it was and how they were enjoying reading it. And this was across the spectrum of people of faith or no faith, people of different backgrounds, people who understood every word in it, people didn't understand some of the words in it. It didn't matter, but just the engagement in the notion that conversation, that technology should be in conversation with ethics, with values, with a sense of thinking deeply about the things you do every day was something worthwhile for folks. And to me, that was really um, reassuring to hear that, you know, the few times I heard it, you know, in different places around the world, whether it was in Europe or North America. And it was just, uh, it felt good that maybe we were doing something that wasn't just to sustain our friendship, but actually had some value beyond it, which led us then to say, let's put this all together into a book. And, you know, we've written a lot of them. Uh, but we're also blessed to have a, uh, someone who contributed to the newsletter here also with us, Zoe Lang. Uh, she can wave her hands. Hi, Zoe. Zoe contributed. Actually, it's the first chapter in the book on the, uh, Genesis, on Breshit, on object-oriented uh, Breshit, object-oriented creation. Really, really interesting chapter. And so it became like a more of a project that kind of like transcended us a bit. Uh, it's been a fun time together, I think. It's been enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed reading it. Um, and, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm more secular, I'm not sort of as like Torah learned, but I know that in my, you know, day to day, one of the concepts that I find myself teaching coworkers about early is sort of like the light intonations uh, concept where like, it's not just enough for us to be, you know, for us as a company or for us as a team or whatever, to sort of act a certain way, but we also want to be like a light intonation. So I think that so many of these like concepts and um, things and ways that we can tie things together about Torah and ethics and tech uh, can be, can be so important and really, really applicable. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. So, yeah. Go ahead, Allison. Yeah, I wanted to um, I wanted to ask if maybe each of you could share a Tzvar Torah from the book, like maybe one of your favorites. Uh, sure, I'll start. Um, so uh, the concept I'll speak about was one that actually uh, I brought up a few times because it's something that's close to my heart. Um, the first time it, it makes an appearance in the book is in Parashat Lech Lecha. Um, where the Torah speaks about the relationship between God and Abraham, God and Avram, and the and when the Torah describes why did God have such a love for Avram, why did God choose Avram out of all the other people around him, the Torah says that He chose him because Avram would be would would teach others. Avram wouldn't keep the knowledge to himself; he would teach others. Lamana that he would 
go, go out into the world and teach others. And this was already at a time that Avram had already proven his, lo proven his loyalty to God by leaving his, his home, going to a faraway country, far away from his family, far away from everything he knew, and following God sort of in closed eyes um, to start off on his own. And yet, the, but, uh, uh, and yet, it's already after the time that he went through the test, you know, he smashed his father's idols, so like the story we all learn. Um, and yet, what was, the, what was the one trait that God chose was the fact that he would teach others, that he would pass it on to other people. And that uh, brought me back to a conversation that we have in tech every few, uh, every few months. Uh, tech Twitter goes crazy. Someone makes a comment about 10x developers, and then everyone tries to figure out what is a 10x developer? Is it a good? Is it is good? Is it bad? How do you eat it? How do you, you know, how do you relate that? And I've seen someone mention, I've repeated this so many times that people start attributing it to me, and I feel bad about that because I heard it from some, I, I read it from someone else, and I don't remember who, and I feel bad that I can't attribute it to them. So if someone does know, please uh, get it back to me. Um, but that a 10x developer is not a developer who can write 10 times more code than other people or who can deal with the code base 10 times the size of other people and, or whatever. A 10x developer is a developer who can create 10 other developers, who can bring 10 other people and bring them up to their level. And, uh, and the reason why I, I, I like why, why this took me is because it boils down to, to, to a concept which is very important to me, the concept of mentorship and teaching. You know, I come from, the, from a world of teaching before technology. I was an elementary school teacher, the Jewish online school. As a, rabbi, as a rabbi, of course, I was teaching others and I still, uh, you know, also my community now, I still, you know, we have weekly classes. And teaching is so central to, to Judaism. You know, we mention it in the Shema, the most important prayer in Judaism that we say every day. And it's so important in every part of life as well, in tech as well, uh, not just so that we can, you know, we think of it as a selfless uh, a selfless activity where we teach others, you know, we help out, bring others back to us. But the truth is that it comes back to us. Back when, you know, Ben mentioned we were in boot camp together, uh, I noticed that the way I learned best was by going back and helping, like, you know, when I would finish a lesson, I would finish a lab, especially if it was a lab that I struggled with, I'd always try to go back and see, find other students who are struggling with the same concepts and explaining it to them would help me solidify it so much, so much more. Uh, one of my favorite Talmudic passages, which I quote often, is Rabbi Hanina said, I have learned a lot from my teachers, and I've learned even more from my colleagues, but I've learned from, but from my students, I've learned the most. The Talmudai Termikulam. By teaching others, we not only help others, it's not just a selfless, thankless task, it actually helps us. We help, you know, it helps us grow. It helps us uh, uh, grow in our as developers, as Jews, as you know, whatever it is. So that is why mentorship uh, features very often in my uh, in my newsletters, and why it spoke so much to me. So, Ben, would you like to share yours? Sure, that was beautiful. And I can attest, by the way, to Yechiel's mentorship because I don't know if I would have gone to the boot camp without him helping me along the way with all the labs. Uh, so we call it member mentorship or, uh, or just helping me figure out how to solve these things. Either way, thank you. Uh, so something that I often think about a lot is our multiplicity, a multiplicity of identities and how they have grown exponentially uh, given all the different form in which we exist online and otherwise. And there's a, a professor at MIT that I refer to often because I think her work is so fundamental. She's basically like the prophet of doom at MIT. Her name is Cheryl, Cheryl Turkle, and she's an amazing person. Uh, got a chance to meet her when we lived in Cambridge uh, several times. And her role in, at MIT is basically to be the voice of pessimism the voice of ethics, the voice of like, hold on a minute, let's take a step back and think through the implications of what we're discussing, whether the implications are around equity and equality issues, whether they're around, um, uh, you know, the societal issues, the whole spectrum of things. And so she has one line, it's a really pithy line, but I think it's a really good line, which is, am I my avatar's keeper? 
In other words, like, is my avatar, is my online persona in whatever form it might be in, whether it's in Slack or Facebook or Discord or Twitter or wherever it might be, am I the same person as those personas? And if I am, and what does that say? And if I'm not, what does that say about me? And I think uh, we find an example of that actually in a very instrumental Parsha, uh, Torah portion uh, from Parsha Dvayigash. Uh, and Parsha Dvayigash, of course, is that moment of reunion uh, between Yosef, between Joseph and his brothers. And, uh, you know, Yosef is now the second in command of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, and uh, he's really a powerful guy. And his brothers come to Mitzrayim asking for uh, sustenance, asking for assistance, because there's a great famine in Eretz Yisrael, and they don't know what they're going to do, and they're kind of bereft. And they come, and they appear before, and they petition this, you know, you can only imagine, you know, if you've ever been to any of the Egyptian sections in, in, in historical museums, sort of like the, the, the glamour and the ostentatiousness of this person, the second in command of the empire, to ask for assistance. And they tell this person, you know, that we have an old father, he's ailing, he's back there in, the, in, in our homeland, and, and we're just coming here, please, can you please lend us something? And the whole time Yosef is watching this, who, who, the brothers who threw him in a pit and sold him to be dead, watching this encounter and trying to decide when to bring together this persona of being the viceroy of Egypt with the persona of, hi of him as their brother. And he has not revealed himself at that point until that moment. And then the moment comes. And the first words he says to his brothers when he reveals himself, the first question he asks them is, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph, Ha'od Avichai, is my father still alive. They just told him before that our father is ailing in Israel. And yet, what does Joseph say? Is my father still alive? He asked the question. Why is he asking that question? And I always thought that, that, that whole moment was a bit odd. Well, there's many oddities in that moment, but that's one of the odd moments, right? Because he already knew the answer. So why was he asking the question? And I think where I found an answer that really um, spoke to me was from the commentator, Rav Ephraim Lunchitz, who was known as the Kliyakar after his book, the most seminal work that he published on Torah commentary. And he said that the reason why Yosef asked that question in that moment was because he wanted to know if the story that the brothers had told him when he was in the viceroy avatar if that story is the same as a story he they will now tell him when he's in his avatar as their brother if it's the same story is it different was he only telling that story were they only telling that story to elicit sympathy from a viceroy of egypt and mentioning an old ailing father who needed help to try and get some uh you know rahmanis to get some kind of compassion or was uh or was that story genuine and I think that that's actually a great lesson for us in the, in the whole topic, in the whole genre of what it is to have these different personas, to have these sort of bifurcated and, and disaggregated identities. And, you know, you run into this all the time. And whether you work in, in technology or you don't work in technology or you're retired and you're home and relaxing in Portland, Oregon, or wherever you might be, uh, hi, Antoniella, um, wherever you might be, um, you know, it's... Uh, we have different moments where we're different people. We're the same person at the end of the day, but different aspects of ourselves. And are you reflecting the aspect of yourself you want to be reflecting in those moments? Is it genuinely who you are in those moments? Or is it, or are you letting other parts of yourself, other parts of maybe your id come through uh, in those personalities, which you might not do if let's say the webcam was on or you were sitting across from the person um, having coffee. You know, you get this a lot in, in, in my role, like with, uh, you know, uh, issues raised in GitHub on like uh, repository. So, you know, I, we, we maintain a lot of different open source projects in our work and a lot of different developers different communities use these projects and they may have an issue that arises for them. And you see sort of the, um, certain types of personalities arise in those issues that become totally different when you engage the person. So the composing of the initial issue, right, when it's anonymous, when you're facing just a blank uh, screen and you can just write a note, becomes a very different personality 
when you now talking to somebody who works at the place or somebody who's engaging with you, who now has a face, who now wants, says to you, I'm so sorry you're encountering this issue. How can I help you? It becomes an entirely different encounter. Well, who was that first person, right? Who was that first person? Who is that second person? It's the same person, but different, different expressions of the same person. It's, it's as if the question that Yosef asked his brothers, you know, Od uh, Avichai, is our father still alive? You told me he was alive when you were these people. But now that you're in this personality, what, what, what's your story now? And so I often think about that. And I think it's something that, you know, I try and talk about in different aspects. And when I write for Torah and tech is sort of the ways in which we exist in the digital spaces and the physical spaces and how we can um, think deeply and critically about the ways in which we present ourselves. And if we're presenting who we want to present in all those, in all those places. I love it. Those are fantastic. Um... Yeah, for me, uh, yeah, it's interesting that you talked about Lech Lecha. So I'm um, pretty secular, but, you know, also former, former Hillel professional. And I think that my favorite Parsha, and honestly, like one of the only ones that I can sort of remember when I hear the name of the Parsha, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember what that one's about is, is Lech Lecha. And for me, um, in the past, it's, sort of been a coincidence that I've often like started new jobs or new moves or just new things around um around that that Torah portion being read uh and so for me I always sort of equate that with like the start of a new like embracing journeys and embracing new journeys and I think that so much of um what we do in in tech no matter how many years you've been working is like a journey every time you start a new feature every time you start you're at a new company every time that you uh you know are looking at a new framework or language right it's like okay we're about to start start this new this new journey into into this new into this new thing. So um, that's, uh, that's one of my, one of my personal favorites. Um, do does anyone have any, any audience questions? I'll start. I can kick us off with one. Um, don't be shy, though, to message me questions that you have. Or again, after this question, I'll, I'll open it up again to see if, uh, see if other folks have questions. Um, so uh, there are lots of different ways to interpret Parshot, um, and in in my opinion, there are some Parshot that are sort of more difficult than others to relate to modern day or to check. I mean, I, you know, recall from my bat mitzvah days, uh, some of the Parshot being like, oh, I'm glad that that one wasn't mine because I have no idea what I would do my, you know, like my little bat mitzvah tvaran. Um, and so I'm curious if there were any uh, if there were any part shows that that you struggled with and you're like, oh, I I should be writing this week or it's my turn to write and I'm not really sure where to start or how to connect it. Oh, obviously some parts are easier than others, like you mentioned. Uh, the good thing is that no Parsha speaks only about one thing. So you can always find something to connect to. Um, and in general, uh, so I guess, uh, first of all, not even if you look through the book, not a, uh, so, some, some weeks we didn't even, it's not even connected to the Parsha. Sometimes it's about uh, current events or sometimes even just a thought that I've had or whatever. Um, but in general, where I would, uh, my main source of inspiration uh, was from the talks of the Lubav Trevi, Rabbi Schneerson. Uh, I'm a Chabad Chassid, so he had a very strong influence on my life. Uh, and his specialty was uh, in sort of putting a positive, positive view on, on, on parts, part, you know, parts of the Torah or just parts of life that many people viewed as negatives. He would always try to find a positive way to look at it. And very often I would find, you know, even some of the more difficult concepts, I would find something, a positive way to, a positive look, a positive angle to share. So. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. By, by the way, I love Yechiel's positivity. It's like uh, it's infectious and everything. Uh, but uh, it's a good question. I think that um, uh, for me, counterintuitively, perhaps my favorite parshiot to talk about are in. <laughs> my wife is already laughing. Are in uh, Sefer Vaikra in the Book of Leviticus, and often, you know, as a when I worked as a Hillel rabbi and a pulpit rabbi, you know, rabbis often talk about how like 
uh, Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus is like the hardest one to discuss. You know, it's much, there's, it's oftentimes a bit simpler to talk about the, the Sfarim were loaded with stories, the books that have a lot of stories, narrative driven, where Leviticus is not so narrative driven. But I often find that from the engineering part of ourselves, Leviticus is actually a great book because it's, it's all about specifications. It's all about the details. It's all about how to implement the values that all the other books are about. So it's the implementation of it, right? So it's like, okay, I got this documentation and now and now I'm going to build it. And that's Leviticus. And Leviticus is both the moments where they got it right and the moments where they, they have delta points, the moments where they could, where they could do better. And, uh, and I think that's brilliant. Uh, so I actually often like writing about the Parshiot in, in Leviticus. And I mean, sometimes now that I, you meant, I, now that I didn't yes. know that, Levit- that Vayikra was your favorite. So now that I know that, I guess next year I can exchange Vayikra and like I'll take Bereshit or something. But. Perfect. Perfect. Because, you know, the problem with like Bereshit or Genesis or Exodus is like, can I say something original? You know, like how many, th- you know, you got to find something original in these stories, oh, you know, but like Leviticus, no one talks about it. So it, it's often very original because it's, you're the only one saying something. Uh, it's not totally true, but it's, it's often neglected in, in, you know, popular commentaries for, for good reasons. Uh, but yet it is the implementation of the documentation. It's beautiful. Nice. Um, we have a few questions that came in. So Hannah is asking, what technical concept have you had the hardest time connecting to Torah learning? Hmm. I'd like for you to go first. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. How to define the hardest? Like, I wouldn't say I tried connecting every single technical concept to a Torah concept. Um, but on that, one of my favorite Dwar Torahs in the book is from Parashat Tetzave, which is probably the most technical, uh, uh, which is probably the most technical Dwar Torah in the book. Um, I, Parashat Tetzave, just as a, some background, um, during the story of the golden calf when the Jews uh, served an idol, and God got angry and wanted to destroy the Jewish people. And Moshe Rabbeinu told God, if you're going to destroy the Jewish people, then I want you to take my name out of the Torah. So even though God ended up forgiving the Jewish people, um, he still took Moshe Rabbeinu's name out of one parsha, which is Parsha Tetzava. The whole parsha is the first one since the beginning of Shemot until the end of the Torah that doesn't mention Moshe's name. But even though it doesn't mention Moshe's name, it still speaks about Moshe in the second, uh, like the Atat Tetzava, you shall, you should, it speaks to him directly. And well, Bob Chirabi pointed out an interesting point that um, a name is the way other people refer to you, but you, that's yourself, that's your essence, who you actually are. So I connected that to uh, the idea of passing values by reference and passing them by, uh, by, by that, uh, passing them by reference or passing by value, where instead of a name, which is sort of your value, um, your essence is who you actually are. That's like, uh, so I went the whole side point of how pointers work and going. Um, it was probably the most technical one. Uh, it was challenging to write. I hope it came across, uh, even if the syntax was a little dense, uh, I hope the point came across, but I still don't know yet. I enjoyed that one, even though I don't know Go Ling, uh, but it was a good one. Um, you know, I think for me, the it's it's not necessarily a particular technical concept that that is challenging i would say that in this industry in writ large obviously with exceptions and and speaking in generalities but writ large there is the idea that what we do in this industry is um absent or doesn't need to be in discourse with values with torah with ethics with thinking about the impacts of what you're doing and that's obviously been challenged a lot in recent days but it's but even when it's been challenged in recent days in different ways there is a there is it feels like an equally weighted counter challenge to that challenge uh it's really strong resistance to the notion that there's anything that technology that that 
technical people, whatever that might mean, the technical people need to be in conversation with, uh, with ethics. So like if I'm working on an, an algorithm that employs recursion, what does like recursion have to do with ethics at all? Like why should I care about ethics when it comes to recursion or if I'm working on something or it takes something more juicy, like I'm working on, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to parse the words, the spoken language of people and try and, and try and, and get the, the speech they say into text. And I'm accounting for different accents, different regionalities. What does that natural language understanding have to do with ethics? It's just a technical problem and a technical solution. And there's nothing in between. And I think when you try and interject something in between, you, you sometimes find a bit of opposition to that, to that, to that entire enterprise of trying to put something, uh, some middleware in between the, those two things. I have to say that the first thing that came into mind for me with this question was that this is like an amazing opportunity for a contest. Um, I feel like developers and programmers in general love to sort of put others in like in the hot seat in some way and like do these do these sorts of contests or games. And I'm I'm imagining uh, a competition where like someone throws out a technical concept and the first person to explain it with a Jewish connection or like in a Jewish context gets a point, right? Like garbage collection, componentization, single responsibility principle. So maybe maybe coming to a conference near you soon. You know, GitHub runs excellent hackathons. I hear a hackathon <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, all right. Sharon asked, uh, are there any values from this new world of tech that you entered that impact your Jewish identities or values? Should I go first this time? Sure. Okay. Uh, not that I have a concrete answer for that, but I'll go first anyways. Um, I think uh, the thing in tech that I think have actually impacted, I think you can find this actually throughout the book as well. And I would venture to say that if you, if you read the Parshiot in the order, uh, calendrically, you can probably see an, uh, an emerging sense of that as the book continues, which is that whereas what I'd earlier said, that technology often faces the people in the tech sector, some people, there is a tendency to face resistance to the notion of values-driven conversation. At the same time, there's, there's an equally important sort of uh, a value or sort of notion or principle in technology, which is to never assume anything is the way it is and to never take it, never just accept something for the way it, that it's presented. You know, uh, we often want to under, you know, the words like magical are bad, bad words, right? Like if, if this just works, that's a bad thing. Like I need to know why this works, how it works, the ways in which it might not work, the edge cases for how it might not work in other instances. I need to really break this down in all of its different iterations and I need to know it and understand it. And if I don't know it and understand it and it just works, I probably am not comfortable deploying that to production because then it's too magical. It's too, it's out there too much. I don't know it. And if I don't know it, I can't fix it. And so I think that sense of never taking anything for granted and just um, always looking at everything to try and probe it to its, to its, to its like fullest that you, you possibly can in that moment. Um, and then not actually deploying it and in, in life circumstances, what does it mean to not deploy something? It might mean not to exercise with it, not to use it, not to utilize it, not to incorporate it, not to walk with it, not to take it as part of you unless you can fully break it down into its smallest components and understand it and rebuild it. If you can't do those things, then you probably shouldn't deploy them. You probably shouldn't use it. And, you know, there's limits to that. And like everything, there's, you know, extreme situations where that might not apply. But in general, the idea that you can break, every, you must be able to break everything down and understand it, rebuild it and be able to then feel comfortable uh, running with it. I think it's something that uh, techno technology that people in this sector, whether they're uh, uh, developers or they're product managers or whatever, wherever area they are in the field, they often will employ that in their work and that bleeds into everything else they do in life as well. Interesting. Uh, for me, it was actually the corollary to that um, <clears throat> where the ability to be comfortable with not knowing 
<laughs> yeah, uh, it's not specific to tech, of course. In fact, even in Judaism as a teacher, you know, you have, you have to get used to being able to say, I don't know. But I think um, getting used to working in tech, which is such a huge ecosystem, especially when you're just starting out, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a baby coder, um, where there's just so much you don't know, you have to be okay to say, you know, I don't know this yet. I'm going to learn it. You know, this is something that, this is, you know, this is one part that I you know that, that I'm going to work on, that I'm going to grow with. Um, so, like I said, it's something that I had before, but working in tech really drove that humility in where it's okay not to know. There's, you know, you surround yourself with very smart people and some of them are likely to know it and be okay to go, go over and ask, get a few different points of opinion, you know, especially in, in tech where a lot of times there isn't one right answer. There may be a few different ways to do it to do every single thing and to get the pros and cons, you know, what's, what are the, you know, what, what are the, what, you know, what, what are the strengths of each approach and the versus the weaknesses? So that humility of being able to step back and say, you know, I don't know this yet, but I'm going to know it. I think that's something that I was helped along. You know, that's a really interesting and it's not, and a really interesting sort of like inverse way of looking at it. And I think about like the trajectory when we were in Flatiron School together and sort of like how comfortable I was when like I, we finally learned, let's say, Rails, Ruby on Rails and how amazing it was to like just have something happen. And it was like, it was magical and awesome and like phenomenal. And I think part of my own personal trajectory as a developer in the past few years has not been the amount of mistakes I don't make because I, I make more mistakes now than I did then but it's actually being the discomfort in like not knowing how it works and like the trajectory of when I first started being very happy just having it work and now it's almost like an, an angst when it's not working or when I don't know when I it's working and I don't understand how it's working. I may not know how it works but I feel angsty if I don't know how it works and so like that sort of like emotional cognitive sort of dissonance around there not like the amount of mistakes I make because they're equal or more than before but like that dissonance of discomfort um, around it. I think there's like a popular meme going around uh, where you see like a developer sitting in front of a computer, like his head in his arms and it's like, it doesn't work and I don't know why. And then you see the same picture, the same developer with his head in his arms, like it works and I don't know why. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, any other audience questions? If not, I'll throw another one out. Before Allison does, though, I just want to, I want to mention that if you're not aware, Allison runs a phenomenal podcast called Pair Driven Development. And this was not discussed that we would bring this up. So this is not sponsored. This is not like promoted in any sort of way. It happens to be a, a phenomenal auditory experience, uh, if I may say so myself. Uh, it sort of like tackles the questions of what it means to be in this industry with familial personal responsibilities that make life more complicated, whether you're a parent or you're another sort of caregiving responsibility where it sort of like changes the way and you often feel in this industry like, um, you know, if you're not 18, like, who are you? And, you know, if you can't party all night, who are you? But like, if you're somebody with responsibilities in life and you're also trying to be in this space, this podcast is a must listen. And she's not, no, I would say that at all, but I, I think it is. So you should listen to it. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just say it's parentdrivendevelopment.com if you want to check out more. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank, thank you. That's sort of my, one of my side projects. Um, so the question that I have for you both is uh, I am always sort of in awe of people that write books and actually manage to publish and put something out into the world. Um, I'm curious what the most exciting part of seeing this book come to life has been. Well, obviously the most exciting part was actually uh, holding it in my hands and like when it became actually real. Um, it's interesting in that we never set out to write a book. Like, I feel like most writers like, okay, I know they have an idea. I'm going to write this book. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write it. They spend however long it takes to write a book. This sort of grew organically. Like we started as a weekly, uh, a weekly newsletter, which I'll admit I thought it would last about a month or two. Um, ended up being my longest ever side project. Um, 
And like, as it became more serious and, you know, for real and more people signed up, I think by now it's over 200, uh, we have over 200 people signed up. And so, uh, so like about a year ago, I helped a friend of mine, like, look, he was writing a book, um, which also tie, it's called the four questions of monitoring or something like that. Um, he's a monitoring specialist and he, uh, he's also Jewish and he, sort of wrote, you know, you can imagine by the four questions title, he tied it into the Passover Seder and he brought in a lot of Jewish concepts from the Passover story to help explain monitoring concepts. And he asked me to look over the Jewish part and, um, just to make sure everything makes sense. And that sort of gave me the idea, which I suggested to Ben. So once we had a year's worth of the Vertoro, we figured, you know, why not? Ben had some experience in publishing, which I had zero. <laughs> so he uh, took on some of the more technical aspects and you know, once it actually became real and we actually, you know, started working on things like layout and design and actually, you know, dividing up costs, you know, things that actually made it tangible, it became for real, you know. Uh, I work with authors in my life. Two of my uncles are published, you know, are Roshi Shiva. They both wrote uh, book, uh, books on, on Talmud. I have another cousin who publishes and my father is works, he's part of the team that publishes the books of the Baba Charebi. So, I've been around the publishers, but never actually uh, did it on my own. So it was very exciting. Yeah, it just, you want to say hi? Okay. It just, it just, uh, it made sense. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know how long it would last either. Uh, and my son loves the book as well, as you can tell. Um, I didn't know how long it would last either, and it felt yeah. like this project, Moshe, I love you. you want Speaking to go to of parent-driven development. Yeah. Parent-driven development right here. Yeah. Okay. You want to talk about Torah? Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> Look at that's the fastest way to... <laughs> here, why don't you share it with Torah? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to share it with Torah? No! We um, all have our methods. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was not you know he loves torah he loves it um it, it just the the project became something like yachil said it became real i didn't know exactly how long it would last either and it certainly wasn't easy to keep on writing week in and week out it's still not easy because there's a lot of things going on in life and this per, this year in particular, this past 12 months have been challenging me personally with different losses in my family. It just was like a lot going on and yet we found a way to keep on doing this. And that itself was, yes, exactly. For that itself was uh, something really viable for me personally to have this as a cons constant sort of project to keep on going with. And uh, it became more meaningful to me as the year progressed and uh, it's, you know, it's on my calendar now, like make sure to, you know, s slot some time to write for Torah every other week for we for Torah and tech. And sometimes I may borrow from my old uh, sermons from years ago, if, you know, if I'm down to the wire, but, uh, you know, it, it's been an adventure. And to also be able to think about this industry that we're still both relatively new in, in the past, in, within our first five years, to be able to think about this industry in this light is also helpful for me. Uh, as sort of a cap to a week. Yeah, I would imagine that it's also, um, I talk often with uh, colleagues and folks about things that sort of empty your cup and things that fill your cup and, you know, being able to sort of sit down and <laughs> sit down and, you know, think about tech or something that you've faced like that week, a challenge, a success, or something from this different perspective. It's just, I generally find it like very, very fulfilling and very much like, you know, taking a break from just sort of the, the day to day of, of the work that tech can sometimes be um, to really consider like, what, what did happen this week? Or what, what am I thinking about? What is on my mind this week? And, and how can I relate it to this larger, broader, different concept that is such a core part of, uh, of my being and of, and of who I am? And I'll also just add quickly that it's also really been viable to create a community of people who are interested in this subject and to be engaged in a subject with those people because the intersection of people who are interested in nerdy and geeky tech 
subjects and people are interested in, in like what can be sometimes esoteric and nerdy Torah subjects and be able to find the middle between those two. Uh, it's not, there, you know, there are, you're there, but there's not a tremendous amount of people in that, in that intersection. And although in my neighborhood here in Israel, there are quite a few, but outside of Israel, not as many. Um, and so just to be able to, ha that's the only reason we made Aliyah, it's like me with nerdy geek uh, Torah loving engineers. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's really just been really special to have that sort of like global community to engage in this conversation with too. It does sound like Camberville, Cambridge, Somerville. It is true. That's true, Zoe. Um, final question, where can people find the book or where can they find out more about Tech and Torah if they'd like to? Glad you asked. Um, so you can find more on our website, torahandtech.dev. That's Torah and spelled out torahandtech.dev.dev. Um, there you can read about the book. There's links where to order the book. And of course, you can also sign up for the newsletter, which is still ongoing. And you can get the first preview of volume two, which is coming out every single week. Um, I think if you're in Israel or other places, uh, you can buy a book depository. We should probably add the link to the website. But we should probably yeah. add the link to the website. Yeah, so it's available on um, basically every major retailer you might think of to buy from. So like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, I think it's even like on Walmart. I don't know if people shop there, but it's there as well. And it's both as an online ebook and also as a paperback. And then if you're outside of the States or you're outside of the UK, uh, you can use Book Depository, which is a really handy website that makes English uh, language books available uh, for purchase in non-English language, primarily English language countries uh, like Israel. Uh, so you can buy from there as well. Um, yeah, torahandtech.dev. Uh, that's the website to go to. Allison shared that link in the chat if anyone wants. Thank you, Allison. And coming from the place of independent publishers, if you enjoyed the book, please leave a review for us on Amazon, on Goodreads, on other places. If you have critical comments about the book, please get in touch with us privately and <laughs> confidentially. <laughs> <laughs> just only slightly kidding but we will love positive reviews on those websites it helps us get out there and get known more it helps uh boost us in the rankings on those websites so any kind of reviews you can leave would be uh most appreciated great thank you everyone so much for coming today and for joining us to chat about tech and torah and for your questions this was wonderful thank you all Thank you. Thanks for Have having a good morning, your day evening, or evening. And yeah. <laughs> Have a great rest of your time zone that you are in. <laughs> Bye.